Hello everybody and welcome back. I'm Deborah Hartswell and you're tuned into BBR Cryptid and Paranormal Investigations. Thank you for joining me and I really appreciate you tuning in. I hope you are well and enjoying your day. Nutnams, Boggarts, Screaming Skulls and the Winnick Giants. From Jenny Green Teeth, who's a terrifying fairer who supposedly drowned children, to Nutnan, a red hot poker wielding pipe smoking sprite who attacked kids who stole nuts from her tree, to Screaming Skulls and the Winnick Giants. Tonight I have some stories for you from around my local area. One of the most well known ones is the Screaming Skull of Wardley Hall. Now, in an ordinary Northwest community, there lies the small town of Wardley. Sat between Swinton and Walkden, if you blinked, you'd miss it. But it does have one infamous resident, which is known as a Screaming Skull. This area is one I know well. The house containing the skull sits directly across from my family's home now, and that's where we moved to when we moved from Salford. We grew up hearing stories of the Wailing Skull and how mishaps would happen if it was moved. We even had a few late night sneaks into the property as older kids, but that usually ended in fright after four or five steps in. There are local reports of lights in the woodland that run alongside the house, wood knocks and quick running figures, and one local burglar went straight, he said, after he was tripped as he was trying to enter the premises by something unseen. Now, the local story says the skull belonged to Father Ambrose Barlow, who was hung, drawn and quartered in 1641. His head was then put on display for all to see in Manchester, before being entombed in the house of the Archbishop of Salford. The skull was lost in history for a while and then rediscovered in the 18th century by the owner of the house. One day, a servant found the skull and he threw the grisly relic into the moat, whereupon a terrible storm that led the owner of the hall descended. The owner decided that it was due to the fact that the skull was moved, and the skull was venting its wrath. He had the moat drained, and the skull was returned to its rightful position. From local stories, the skull seems to be indestructible, as it's said that it's been buried, burned, and smashed into pieces, always to be found outside the hall the next day, wearing its eternal grin. Now Jenny Greenteeth is one kids in the North West will know well. And a Jenny Greenteeth is said to be a swamp dwelling water loving fairy. And they lurk at the bottom of watery pits and with their long sinewy arms they are dragged in and drowned the local children when venturing too near. Jelly also hunted after children who did not brush their teeth. She was reported living in Garton, Jarlisden and Stockport, where she sat in the trees and moaned, and in Manchester, where she lived in a culvert under the aqueduct, which carries the Manchester and Ashton Underline Canal over Store Street near the London Road Station. Nutnan is another bogey, an old tree fairy who smoked a pipe who lived in hazel groves where nut-bearing trees were a precious local commodity frequently raided by children. Woe betide any young Mancunian who went to pick the nuts, particularly before they were out to eat. The nut nan carried around a permanently hot poker and she'd burn any boy or girl foolish enough to take her nuts. There were several Manchester nut nuns and in the 19th century one included a headless lady who lived in Boggart's Hole Clough and who, despite having no head, screeched, terrifying the local children. There was also another Boggart at South Clock House and that's in Droylsden. And Droylsden, to be honest, has a number of Boggarts because that word in the North West can be used for anything scary or supernatural. One of the most interesting, as I say, was the bogger of South Clock House. He was covered in ghostly white clothes and he used to have the run of the property. He would rip bedclothes off sleepers and terrified anyone who woke up by swelling to an enormous size in the candlelit room. Neighbours also complained that the bogger used to perch in a high branch 
on a nearby yew tree, terrifying passers-by. In the end, matters in the neighbourhood got so bad, a series of vicars and priests were called together to do a supernatural battle with the boggart. They managed, using ceremonies, to trap the boggart beneath the very yew tree where he had sat. Now, the boggart at Boggles Hole Clough chased entire families from their homes, and there was also a recent case of stones being thrown by unseen forces in the clough itself. The haunted house at Church Street, Lees. Now, the most haunted road in the village of Lees is said to be Church Street, formerly known by the suggestive name of Sorcery Lane. It was a short street, but it had two different and terrifying spirits. One of the old dwellings acquired the name of Boggart House because of it being haunted by a hobgoblin, which had the appearance of a calf, some said, with a cap on its head. And others said it had a frill around its neck. A woman, meanwhile, in the same street, had murdered her two children in the cellar. And it was said that the restless ghost of these poor children flitted up and down the road for all to view. Now there is also another screaming skull called Dicky. Dicky was the skull of a murdered man a woman, depending on who you ask, that lived just over the border in a Derbyshire house. And when Dickie's skull was moved from his home, Dickie would become furious and poltergeist activity would begin. Dickie became so angry at the building of the railway that it was claimed he repeatedly brought down the embankment to stop the modern world, ruining his peace with steam whistles. Now the Winnick giant skeletons are ones that I actually didn't stumble on these. These were sent to me by a gent called Lee Hughes. And it's all to do with St Oswald's Church. And St Oswald's is a grade one listing building. It dates back to 1330. And some parts of it are uh, much earlier. Now the building's thought to be on the site of a quite earlier church. And there is a tradition that prior to this, there was a pen, oh, sorry, a pagan temple that occupied the site. Three giant skeletons were discovered under the chancel in 1828, which was thought to support this theory. Now, Lee Hughes is very helpful with some local knowledge for me on the church. In the early 1800s, the church was extended and an ancient burial mound was disturbed. Within the mound, they discovered three eight-foot skeletons. This isn't a local myth or legend, it's a factuality, it's actually a recorded account. I seem to remember reading that the skeletons were taken to be studied at possibly Liverpool University, but when I searched for them, there was no explanation of what happened to the skeletons. Now, there are numerous ancient burial sites and ancient wells in this area. In fact, many of them run in lines across most of the northwest of England. Now, there's also an ancient holy well in the grounds of St Oswald's itself. Someone who may have taken great interest in the giant skeletons is another of our local legends known as Oud Kanker. And Oud is uh, a northwest word for old. So you'll have heard of Burke and Hare, the Edinburgh grave robbers, who turned to murder for greed. But were you aware of Manchester's very own resurrection man, Oud Kanker? There's a passageway called Kanky's Ginnel. And it runs from the River Irk to the churchyard at St Lennon, somewhere around Middleton. According to the local legend, it was used by a local grave robber named Hanker to transport the bodies down to the river and onwards into Manchester to sell. Now, it is unclear whether Kanky actually existed, as no one has ever been able to find anything tangible other than word of mouth. According to some... Kanka would watch as grieving relatives buried their dead and even join them at the wake. Then by cover of darkness, he would dig up the bodies, rob any valuables and sell them to the highest bidder. A place very close to my heart, the haunted place of the Kersel cell. Now, back when Salford was a very small hamlet with only 11 homes within it, if you were brought before the magistrate, that would mean that the magistrate only visited once a month. Uh, once a year, sorry, not once a month. You'd have been much luckier. Once a year, the magistrate would come around. So if you were fortunate and you got caught the week before he was due, then you just did a week at the girls' cell. 
But if you did it, got caught the day after he was due, you had to wait for him to come round again. And then those prisoners would be walked to Lancaster following the Irwell route. Now, the Irwell route is a place where we have lots of hairy, upright type creature reports. And it's a place I still visit now. And other than the weird, hairy creature reports, there are also some strange events and ghostly sightings of monks around the Kersal cell. My own father actually had an experience with an apparition on the moor many moons ago when he was in his 20s. He worked as a steeplejack on the cooling towers at the Agecroft pit and he said one night walking home he saw a woman holding a skirt running fast and she vanished as he walked across Kersal Moor. One old gent said he saw the ghost of a grey lady on the moor on many occasions. One of the most haunted areas is the old priory known as the Kersal Cell. One policeman had an unforgettable encounter here back in 1958 and it was a regular job for the night dog patrolman back then to visit the premises each night after midnight. As you may know, if you're local, the path in from Littleton Road close to the Irwell was made from some kind of cinder or gravel path. I think it was actually slag from the pit. The PC had checked the premises and he was just leaving the hall and walking back towards Littleton Road playing fields. Not wanting to give away his presence, the officer never walked on the noisy path, but he kept to the side grass to keep as quiet as possible. He heard footsteps on the gravel behind him and when he stopped, and looked round there was nobody there he continued walking and the footsteps started again his dog was a big well-trained Alsatian and it stopped at the side of him and the officer felt it go rigid and all its hair seemed to stiffen the footsteps continued to approach and the dog let out a howl and ran off at top speed to Littleton Road now the officer stood still and the footsteps continued and clearly passed him a few feet away and continued towards Littleton Road. He found the dog later and apparently took him some time to calm it down and also himself. And for the next part of tonight's upload, we go a little closer to home for me. Tales from the North West continue with yellow-eyed beasts and misses. We just saw a bear. A number of years ago, Whilst talking to the witnesses that I had found to the Salford Wild Man, that's the name given to an upright, hairy, bipedal creature that's seen quite often on the Uwa Valley route, I was chatting with one of the witnesses' relatives about anything strange that they may have noticed in the area of Buell Hill, as he'd lived and worked in that area for many years. Now, the witness's name is C.J. Thomas, and he lived very close to this area. One night, in the very late hours, after a lock-in at the Ashfield Labour Club, he had a strange encounter. He said he was walking in between the Ashfield and the Old Dog Entry, just off Sandy Lane, and he was lighting his cigar, and he saw something that he can still remember to this day. He stated he could not put a name to what he saw, but that it was dark, hairy, and crouched over. As the witness backed off, the almost dog-like thing growled at him, he said. He described the eyes as yellowish and really scary, and he made off before the animal approached him further. Now, he has owned dogs all of his life, and he's quite used to the different breeds of them. He's raced and trained greyhounds for over two decades. He said, this was no dog. I've never seen any li- anything like this thing before or since. The way it growled and the size of it and the way it moved was unreal. I can still see it in my mind to this day and it was back in the 70s when I saw it. It was the same colour as a very dark Alsatian dog but much bigger and much bulkier. Now, I remember the dog entry... Um, that he's speaking about because it's just off Sandy Lane and it's a route that we would take from school to back. Nobody knows why it's called a dog entry. It's a very old Victorian, very narrow brick stone walkway and as Salford's based on quite um, a steep sided hill, it took you from one area of Salford up to the next. No lights on it, it was awful. It was like something out you'd imagine in a Jack the Ripper movie but we called it the dog entry but nobody seems to know why. 
Another report from not too far away is Mrs. We just saw a bear. And that's a very new report that came in. It came in on June the twenty June twentieth, twenty twenty. Frankie Boo's bear sighting. One local resident was driving home from a journey. He was driving into the estate next to the old water st- sewage station just off Avon Avenue. Earlier that day, when walking his dog, he realised as he entered the house, the dog had dropped its expensive Congwell toy somewhere on the backfield. So he was delighted to see it lying in the road just outside of his house. So he pulled up short, and as he got out to retrieve it, two young boys, aged around eight and nine, came running from the wood, excited and all talking at once. The gent's wife, who was with him, asked what was wrong, and the older of the boys said, Mrs... We just got chased by a bear in there. Can you get your dog to get it? And he pointed to the woods at the end of Avon Drive. Trying to calm the boys down, the wife asked if they were sure it wasn't a big dog or someone having them on. But they were insistent that he'd heard growling noises. So being boys, they threw stones in the direction of where the, where the noise was coming from. They saw a large dark bear move slightly into the clearing on all fours. So they threw two more stones at this bear and set off af- and the bear set off after them. They were breathless and all overheated by the time they made it to the street. So what did they see out there, close to Eleanor's Brook? I'm not really sure. But another port report from the very same strip of woodland happened only a few years ago. This report was made by a young girl at university and she said, I went to our local woods to do an urban art project for uni. I had to photograph my area close to home and collect items and make an art piece with them. Then I had to leave the art piece out there in the woods. I'd done this for the last six weeks running and I'd had some really strange experiences down there. One of the dog walkers who was a neighbour said the same thing to me. Certain times my camera had cut off for no reason. Our photographs that I'd taken that were there on the day when I got back home weren't there. But on this particular day, I had two cameras with me because of this. And my sketchbook and my pens. My mum came in with me. She helped me to get into the woods themselves because it's really overgrown. Not many people go down there. We had to beat a path in. It's full of nettles and brambles and ivy and all intertwined. I walked around for a while and I collected sticks and interesting pebbles to use in the project. As we got to a bit of the woods that's enclosed and quiet, everything seemed to change. And there were sticks placed in the branches of the trees around us. It was really weird. I had an intense feeling of being watched. And as I went to tell my mum, she nodded her head slightly in the direction I felt watched from. So I knew that she felt it too. We both kind of laughed nervously. And right next to us was a really loud knock on the tree. Not a tap, a huge whack. We were startled, but mum clapped out of shock. And the knock came again, just nearer to us, but to our left. I was spooked, but it went quiet. We waited and nothing happened. So I decided to stay and sketch. But I walked off further and just left my mum sat where she was. I sat and sketched and I heard a quiet voice. It was a whisper and a whispered reply coming back. I was so shocked, I just couldn't believe this was happening. This went on for about five or ten minutes and I just tried to ignore it and sketch, but it kept happening. And at one point I said out loud, is it okay for us to be here? And I heard a whisper at back, but I couldn't make it out. Mum caught up with me, I told her what had happened. And as I looked over her shoulder at her approaching, I knew there was something to the right of her in the shrubs. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was there just watching her. And we slowly left, not scared, just confused. And I felt compelled to say thank you as we left. Two of the strange reports were made by people when we asked around the neighbours. Two young girls who were building grass dens on the field had stones thrown at them from the woods, first from the left, and then straight away from the right. At first, they thought it was local boys and a set of kids playing tricks on them. So they threw stones back to be confronted with a very loud bang. So they ran off. 
One lady was walking a dog. She was visiting the woods and she had her large husky dog with her. She said she knows the area well. She uses it to forage for mushrooms and wild foods. She's walked the fields and woods for years and knows them well. She explained there was one time when she visited a small copse called Eleanor's Wood and suddenly, for no reason, she felt sick and dizzy and confused. Her dog seemed to transform into a wolf-like beast right in front of her eyes and she felt as though they'd slipped through time or through a rip into another world. She had no idea where she was or how to get back home. And when she came to, she felt confused and shaken and she didn't visit the area for many months afterwards. Another of the neighbours said that she'd been spooked down there when walking the dogs because she'd heard her name called on several occasions. Now close by in a woodland is Lonely Turton Tower and this was investigated by Erica Gregory and other members of the Worst of the Paranormal group. She managed to capture an interesting image. They were investigating the Turton Tower when she noticed something strange on the lawn outside the Grade 2 listed 15th century building. We went into the grounds to get some fresh air and we were on the main lawn at the front of the house, explained Erica. And the group has documented various unnerving phenomena throughout Bolton during their 12 years. The first, uh, the full moon was out, she said, and it looked nice. So the group were just taking some pictures at first. I looked over towards a tree and I saw a sort of grey mist. So I got my phone out and took a photograph. The resulting image was almost completely pitch black. But when Erica backlit the photo using an infrared filter, she was staggered to see what looked like the image of a woman in a long dress peeping out from behind the tree. I just thought, brilliant. I knew I'd captured something important. It's rare to get something like this, said Erica. Numerous people have reported experiencing bizarre phenomena at Turton Tower. One of the recurring stories is that of a lady dressed in a long morning gown and she is heard to shuffle among the rooms of the hall, sobbing, sobbing. Sorry, The same figure has been seen on the lawn outside the house. But Erica seems to have captured the first image of Lady Turton. Who knows, said Erica. It may be that this is the same figure that others have reported seeing. Erica and a group are well known in the area and have visited many of the local hotspots. 